In case you've ever wondered about my little tail, it grew out of my numerous and dangerous encounters over the years. But it wasn't documented, so to speak, until 1827, when a Mr Collier and the artist, old George Crookshank, came round to see me at the King's Arms. I never had a more amusing morning. Piccini was a strange-looking character, a thick-set man who had lost one eye. The dirt, darkness and uncouthness of this elderly Italian's abode, together with the forbiddingness of the Irish Mrs. P, I shall never forget. Mr. Payne Collier, who was to write the description, the publisher and myself, formed the audience. As the performance went on, I stopped it at the most interesting parts to sketch the figures, whilst Mr. Collier noted down the dialogue. And thus the whole is a faithful copy and description of the various scenes represented. Ladies and gentlemen, pray how you do. If you all happy, me all happy too. Stop and hear my merry little play. If me make you laugh, me need not make you pay. The figure, whose neck he used to stretch to such a great height, was a sort of interlude. Piccini made the figure take off his hat with one hand, which he defied all other puppet show performers to do.
Punch, you know, sir, is a dramatic performance in two hacks. It's a play, you may say. I don't think it's a tragedy exactly. A drama is what we name it. There is tragic parts, and there is comic and sentimental parts too. Some families where I perform will have it most sentimental, in the original style. Others is all for the comic. And then I have to kick up all the games I can. To the sentimental folks, I am obliged to perform very steady and very slow and leave out all comic words and business. They won't have no ghost, no coffin, and no devil. And that's what I call spoiling the performance entirely. It's the march of intellect what's a doing it. That's what it is. Oh, where was I? Oh, yes. I was going to tell you a bit about my history. Well, it's a matter of some confusion. But let's go backstage a while and spy a little of my heritage. Oh, Ooh, it's dark down here. Oh, I don't really know where to begin. Some say that my ancestors were those uncouth Roman revellers with their masks and mime stories. Believe it or not, this might have been me in a puppet show around 1340. And strangely, many of the so-called miracle plays of this time were about people whose lives were disrupted by the servant of the devil. Though I wouldn't want to be compared too closely with that rogue. In the later Middle Ages, the travelling showmen and minstrels performed great combats with rough plots and improvised speech and the fairgrounds were the most popular pitches for these entertainers. It is rumoured that at Bartholomew's Fair, a showman called Old Leatherhead used a puppet to thump his audience on the head with a stick. <laughs> Still, my great moment was yet to come. This was during the Commonwealth. For Oliver Cromwell, who was a bit of an old Puritan, closed all the playhouses. But the puppet shows were allowed to continue and were almost the only public opportunity for drama and vulgarity. After the Restoration, in 1660, the very fashionable King Charles opened the floodgates to all those Continentals. And that's when I, or rather, Mr Punchinello, made my first real appearance. Well, it was probably as a marionette, strung up on the strings. In 1666, that old gossip, Samuel Pepys, visited a number of street shows around Covent Garden. He noted in his diary, I did hear a couple call their fat child Punch, which pleased me mightily. That word having become a word of common use for everything that is thick and short. The 18th century was a golden age of puppetry. And one of the most popular performers was an hunchback called Martin Powell. With him, I toured the country, providing comic relief with my scolding wife, Joan. Do you know, I attracted some very fashionable audiences away from the opera to my show. Still, fashion changed fast, and puppet shows fell out of favour. So it was back to the fairgrounds and a begging bowl for me. In 1733, old Hogarth spotted me down at Southwark, painted on a sign, wheeling old Judy around in a wheelbarrow. Oh, there were some right goings on down there. I have to say, it was damned hard work trudging round from fair to fair, and my staging was very difficult to transport. So, with a snip of the scissors, I cut my strings and took to the street corners as a brawling hand puppet. My best street performer turned out to be this bloke, Giovanni Piccini, who'd come here from Italy around 1785. The 
first time that ever I went out with Punch was in the beginning of August 1825. I did all I could to avoid being seen. It hurt me dignity to be obligated to take to the streets for a living. But I made as much as eight bob. And my master said to me, after the performance was over, you'll do. I have heard tell that old Puccini used to take very often as much as ten pound a day. And he'd sit down to his fowls and his wine, and the very best of everything, like the finest gentleman in the land. Indeed. He made quite enough at the business to be quite a tip-top gentleman, but he never took care of a eighty what he got. He was past performing when I bought my show of him, and very poor. I gave him thirty-five bob for the stand, the figures and all. I bought it cheap, you see, for it was thrown on one side and was of no use to anyone but such as myself. There was twelve figures and the other apparatus, such as the gallows, the ladder, the horse, the bell and the stuffed dog. Good Lord, I'd almost forgotten. In that show, there was me, Judy, the brat, the bloody-minded beadle, joke a minute Scaramouche, nobody, whoever he was, Jack Ketch, the grand senior, know-it-all doctor, the devil, there was no ghost at that time, Mary Andrew and that stupid old blind bugger. I haven't seen those last two lads for a long time now. Ah, oh, those were the days. I'm interested in Punch to walk going through Berner Street. You know Berner Street, do you? In the, uh, yeah. Off of Arthur Street. Yeah. Well, there was a firm in Berner Street um, called Kerwin's Music Publishers, and they had a wonderful window display of puppets. See? Um, they weren't Punch and Judy, they were glove puppets or hand puppets. Fascinated me, in fact. I was rooted at this window display for several minutes. And now for the first time, I saw puppets in another light, see? Well, in the war, uh, father was just too old to be, to be conscripted. And he hit on the idea of putting Punch into uniform. For instance, uh, Punch was in uniform as a private, you see, and uh, Judy became Judy from the Naffy, so she would have a, a Naffy costume on. The hang hangman, Jack Ketch, the hangman, well, uh, he became Hitler, and because Hitler used to be hung twice nightly at the Bedford and the Metropole and, and music halls up and down England, <laughs> up and down England. Now, Percy was a great showman. He could stuff his hand up my pants and turn me into a right old weapon-wielding anarchist. Now, give me that thing. <laughs> give me the bit. <laughs> give me that thing. <laughs> give me that thing. You're the wife beater. I'm going home to mother. Wait a agree it's a funny name. Well, you see, it's a nickname of the grand-sounding Mr. Punchinello, the English version of the French Polichinelle, who in turn comes from the Italian character Polchinella. Got it? 
Pulcinella was a character in the Italian Commedia dell'arte. Up-nosed, hump-backed, fat-bellied and married. Mind you, that didn't stop him going after the girls. Still, it was my Gallic friend who rounded me off, so to speak, and added a very nice little costume. We calls him Punch. That's partly for short and partly on account of the boys, for they calls it Punch in Hello. Oh, they'd say, there's Punch in Hell. And general folks don't like to hear them words. Punch is cunning and full of antics, artful-like. My opinion of Punch is he's very eccentric, with good and bad morals attached. Very good he was in regards to benevolence. The carving on my mug is a great art, and I reckon my nose and chin by meeting together is quite admirable. Me ump is never to be got rid of. I was born with it, and I's never to be done without it. The same goes for my belly. I recognise I'm a bit out of what is commonly known as proportion, <laughs> what with thin pins and small arms as well. But I think, in the long run, you will have to admit I'm a great beauty. The great difficulty in performing punch consists in the speaking, which is done by a call like this here. Really, there is one of the secrets of the trade. We don't want too many at it. But I'll tell you this, sir, they aren't made of tin and they aren't made of zinc, because both of them metals is poisons in the mouth and injurious to the constitution. They ain't whistles, but calls, or unknown tongues as we sometimes name them. Because with them in the mouth, we can pronounce each word as plain as any parson. <coughs> yes, Punch. Amen. I learned the use of mine from Piccini himself. My master, whom I went out with, at first would never teach me and kept it all secret from me. I was six months learning the use of it. I kept practicing away night and morning with it until I got it quite perfect. It was no use trying at home because it sounds quite different in the open air. When I was practicing, I used to go into the parks and fields and out of the way places so as to get to know how to use it. Now. I'm reckoned one of the best speakers in the whole profession. <laughs> There's that old croc. Very popular he is. You know, he replaced the devil in my show. Jaws of hell and all that. Ah, the poor old devil seems to have gone right out of fashion. I can stop him. He won't bite with a kind crocodile. Go and throw him. Coward. Oh. He won't bite. We always have a partner now to play the drum and pipes and collect the money. This, however, is only a recent dodge. In older times, we used to go about with a trumpet. That was Piccini's ancient style, but now that's stopped. Punch has two types of performances, long shows and short shows, all according to the denari. The short shows we can only do in the private by streets, and of them we can do about 20 in a day. Of the long pitches, we can only do about eight in a day. The long pitches we fixes at the principal street corners of London. The best pitch of all is Leicester Square. There's all sorts of classes passing there. Then comes Regent Street and Oxford Street and Well Street. All our favourite pitches for punch. We don't do much in the city. People has their heads all full of business there. And them as is greedy out of the money ain't no friend of punches. Hampstead ain't no good neither. They've got too poor there. I'd sooner not go out at all than to Hampstead. We, in general, walk some 12 to 20 miles every day. 
and carries the show, which weighs a good half hundred at the least. When Mr. Punch performs to any nobleman's juvenile pies, he requires a little refreshment and spirits before commencing, because the performance will go far superior. But where teetotalers is, he plays very mournful, and they don't have the best parts of the dramatical performance. There was a Miss Polly, and she was Punch's mistress, and dressed in silks and satin. His wife was so ugly that he had to have a mistress. You see, a head like that there wouldn't please most people. The mistress Polly dances with Punch, just like a lady in a drawing room. There ain't no grievance twixt him and Judy on account of Miss Polly, because Judy don't know nothing about it. Miss Polly was left out of it because it ain't exactly moral. Opinions have changed. We ain't no better off, Fancy. Such things go on, it's just people don't like to let it be seen. That's the difference. Judy's dress, you see, is far different, bless you, from Miss Polly's. Judy's is bed furniture stuff, and Miss Polly's is silks and satins. Well, that's the way of the world. <laughs> but what comes off second best? going on here? Oh, I don't like the look of this. Ah! No oh, thanks. No reform today. Could be surgery. Ah! Make him laugh! Make him laugh! Make him laugh! Who's the officer here, eh, Mum? May we? I say, Mr. Pug. Taking Polly away was just the start of their tricks. <laughs> They pinched all my best friends and changed my enemies. Poor old Hector's been led away to pasture. The blind man stumbled off. Can't be cruel to them these days. That interfering old nigger servant has become a cheery black and white minstrel. The police only seem to be doing their duty. My old friend Mr Scaramouche has opted, leaving me to that prankster Joey. I said, you can't go around here knocking down poor people like they're there. I say so. I do. Turn to one side. Turn to one side. What's this you've been up to here? What's this I see before me? Aha! Uh -huh. One poor fellow. Aha! Uh -huh. Two poor fellows.
four. for the gentlemen and those large, well-fed families. You understand? I was forced to earn a living. Tough times ahead. Mm, those buggers forced me to soften my humour, fed me saccharine in me tea to sweep me on me side. They pulled out my Italian teeth one by one. Oops, no offence. Very sorry, madam. The Marquis of Townsend celebrates his coming of age a day too late for the coronation. Had he reached the age of 21 on the 12th, he would have been present in the Abbey as a peer instead of as a minor. Still, his coming of age party at Raynham Hall in Norfolk is a great success. There are hundreds of peasants and hearty congratulations from tenants and friends. It's a proud moment for his mother too. There's a tea party for the children and a Punch and Judy show. For the Marquis of Townsend is 21 today. I remember that the place to earn a bob or two was down a seaside. Those kids love Mr. Punch. I suppose it's because I get away with my little misdemeanours whilst they get a clip round the ear hole. I must say that lately I thought my chips were up. Doomed to nostalgia and gummy, screaming mouths in Dulwich on Saturday. I could do with a bit of a blood transfusion to give me hope of new blood and terror, fresh satire and foe. There are operas and romances. A romance is far different to a opera. Punch is an opera, an uproar we call it, and the most pleasing and the most interesting as was ever produced. Punch never was beat and never will be. <coughs> ah. <laughs> I'm... I'm Jack Clett, the public executor. Now, sir, you'll be found guilty by 12 minutes through of throwing your baby downstairs, <laughs> you listen in, give your poor wife you this her, and kill the cousin. <laughs> now, sir, to the face of the law, hang by your neck until you are dead, dead, dead. <laughs> Just wait, wait, wait. Now, sir, you have the goodness to take, to take your head and place your head inside there. Take your head and put it there. In there. Where are you going? Not round the side there. In there. This time in there. Not there. In the middle there. What's up there? By the side, I wanted to put your head in the loop. It's not in the soup. It's very stupid. Shall I show him what to do? All right, now you stand there. Now stand back. I don't move. I want you to your place your head in like that there. <laughs> and when you've done that, I will take over and I'll say count three. One, <laughs> two, <laughs> three. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> the opera moves on two planes, the factual and the allegorical. On the factual plane, Punch successively murders his baby, his wife, the doctor, the lawyer, and Corregos himself. 
and goes on successive quests for pretty Polly, the ideal woman to whom he is ultimately united. On the allegorical plane, Punch represents a man in search of his own identity, for whom the murders represent a ritual rejection of social, personal and psychological claims, and for whom pretty Polly is a symbol of self-definition and integration. <laughs> In the second scene, which exactly parallels the first, both musically and dramatically, Punch rejects the dual demands of legal justice and psychiatric remedy in the persons of the doctor and the lawyer. The cyclical nature of the opera now begins to be apparent. The doctor and lawyer together accuse Punch of his crimes against society and then join with him in a threefold riddle game. They are unable to give the right answers and Punch leads them away to execution. Punch now falls asleep, but his subconscious throws up a violent nightmare in which his victims return to torture him and accuse him of the wrongs he has committed against them. Come 
old Nick does in fact come to call, disguised as Jack Ketch the hangman. Punch and Ketch play a riddle game. And when Death reveals his true identity, it is he that now leads Punch to the murder altar where a gibbet has been set up. This poor bloke hanging about to dry. Let's yes. take it down, but the place is untidy. It's lying down there. Let's take this away. Yes. <laughs> oh, it's gone for a burden. Yes. Now, we told you to be a spare. I said about punch. I got the belly box to put him in. Yes. Here you are. Yes. Combination one. Bed and breakfast only. Yes. You take one now, pick the other. Yes. Oh, it's a little bit too long. That's the idea. If it's perfect, don't forget his handy pages. Now he's put him with this. Oh, <laughs> now we must have a good send off. There's no jolly fine cry, my first cry. Oh dear. Oh dear dear. Oh dear dear. Oh my poor brother Nick. Oh my poor sister 
就看了不是死了，哪里嘴巴不不了往马笑啊？不要跟他生气嘛，哈哈，再再考虑了，是让我试试看呗。你嘴巴阿个那个人，要管，我来管，我来跟他聊，我来你聊 ，turn around， you will lead the way， it's gonna be bright, very strong， we lead this very way。We hope the public at large will help us keep our head above water so that we shall never float down the River Thames to be picked up, coroner's inquest held, taken to the workhouse, popped into the pit hole, and there's an end to another poor old punch. Damage done, the hurly burly's lost and won. Hurly burly's frenzied pace will linger in this friendly place for longer time when you have gone than ever you thought time could run. And though you haven't us offend, this comedy is at.